Hi guys, my name is Ramon Goose and this is The Guitar Show. In this video we're going to be looking at the history of the Beatles amplifiers. We're going to start with a group called the Quarrymen, which were the precursor to the Beatles. This group featured John Lennon, Paul McCartney and George Harrison on guitars, Duff Lowe on piano and Colin Hanton on drums. There was no bass guitar. Up until this time, the Quarrymen had only used acoustic instruments, with no amplification other than the simple microphones used for singing at concerts. McCartney recalls his first amplifier. I've still got my first amp. I think I got it from Curry's, the electrical shop. Nobody could afford electric guitars, they were very expensive. So what you would buy was a pickup and an amp, and you put your pickup on your acoustic. I got this green amp called an El Pico which was great. It was really built for some bygone era where there were mics and gramophones. It was probably the cheapest I could find, you know? Not being a cheapskate, but I didn't have that much money and our family wasn't rolling in it. So I couldn't really hit my dad for it. I've still got it. It's brilliant. The amp that McCartney bought was an El Pico AC55. At the time, the retail price would have been £24. The El Pico had inputs for mic one, mic two and gramophone. Probably not intended for guitar use, though many ended up employed in that fashion. It featured separate volume controls and shared bass and treble dials. The valve lineup consisted of an ECC83 valve, two EL84 valves and an EZ81 rectifier for the power stage and two ECC83 for the preamp. The speaker was an elliptical Celestian model. The Quarrymen then disbanded and reformed with another guitarist called Ken Brown. Whilst the Quarrymen performed a residency at the Casper Club in Liverpool, they used Ken Brown's Watkins Westminster Amplifier. The residency was for a period of six weeks only in 1959. The Watkins Westminster Amplifier was 10 watts and it had two ECL82 power valves and one EC83 preamp valve. It also had an EZ80 rectifier, and in 1957 and 58, its price was 15 guineas. So whilst they performed this six weeks at the Casper Club, there were two amplifiers. One was Paul's El Pico amplifier, which had three inputs. And also Ken Brown brought along his Westminster amplifier, which had two inputs. So this would have been enough to amplify all four guitar players. In 1960, the Quarrymen consisted of a new lineup which was Lennon, McCartney, Harrison, and Lennon's friend from art college, Stu Sutcliffe, who joined the group as a bass player. The group were now known as the Silver Beatles. It was around this time that George Harrison went to Hesse's music store in Liverpool and purchased a Selma True Voice Stadium TV-19T amplifier. This was a 14 watt amplifier. The Selma amp featured tremolo. It used the following valves, three EF-86s, an ECC82, an ECC83, two EL84s, and an EZ81. It featured a 12-inch Goodman's Audioam 60 speaker. It had three inputs in a triangular format and six control knobs, volume for channel one, volume for channel two and three, tremolo speed and depth, bass and treble knobs, and also came with a foot switch included for the tremolo on and off. Just want to mention here that the Shadows also used this Selma amplifier up until about May 1960 as their amp. On August the 12th, 1960, Pete Best joined the now renamed Beatles on the drums. On August the 17th, 1960, the Beatles started to perform at the Indra Club in Hamburg. From this publicity photo taken at the Indra Club, we can see the Beatles with three amplifiers. Next to Lennon and Harrison, you can see the Selma True Voice amplifier. In front of Paul McCartney is the El Pico. And towards Stu Sutcliffe's left is a Watkins Westminster amplifier. Okay, the general consensus is that this Watkins amplifier was owned by Pete Best. Another story goes like this. The Beatles decided that they needed three amplifiers for Hamburg. The new True Voice, Paul's El Pico, and if they could get it, the amp at Watkins Westminster owned by Solka which was the art school student union. John, who had been a student there, decided to get in touch with a committee member, his friend, June Harry, and persuaded her to meet him at the college, as she would remember. I was a fool who had the key to the cupboard where it was kept. John begged it off me because they were going to Germany. 
I said I couldn't give it to him because I'd get into terrible trouble. But he said, you won't. I'll have it back soon enough before anyone notices. He could be quite persuasive and of course he didn't and I got kicked off the committee. They said I was irresponsible. In fact, I never saw John again. The Beatles only performed at the Indra Club until October the 3rd and this was because of complaints about the noise from tenants living above the club. The Beatles were moved to another venue, the Casa Keller. The drummer Pete Best insisted that around this time the Beatles were quite a loud live band. And let's face it guys, around this time I guess audiences weren't really used to really loud amplifiers. It's worth pointing out that only the vocal microphone was actually amplified through the PA system. It's pretty obvious that uh, the Watkins Westminster would not have made a very good bass amplifier. So Sutcliffe bought a tweed covered Gibson Les Paul GA40T amplifier, which was 16 watt all valve. It contained two 6V6 GT power tubes, one 12AX7 inverter tube, two 5879 preamp tubes, and one 6SQ7 tube to power the tremolo effect. It also contained a 5Y3 GT rectifier tube plus a 12 inch Jensen speaker. This would be the first American amplifier that the Beatles would use. He purchased this for £120. Around November 1960 in Hamburg, Lennon purchased a new Fender amplifier. This was a narrow panelled Tweed Vibrolux which came with a pair of 6V6 GT power tubes, two 12AX7 preamp tubes and a 5Y3 rectifier tube. This amp produced 10 watts of power through a Jensen 10 inch speaker. The amp also featured a vibrato circuit with speed and depth controls. Lenin would use his Reckenbecker 325 also made in America through this amplifier. At the beginning of December 1960, McCartney, Harrison and Bess were all back in Liverpool. However, Lennon and Sutcliffe decided to stay on in Hamburg. Although by December the 10th, Lennon had journeyed back home with his two most prized possessions. He carried his new Rickenbacker guitar in a case and strapped his Fender Ribolux tweed amp to his back. In April 1961, the Beatles then made a second trip to Hamburg. On this trip, Lennon played his Rickenbacker 325 through his Fender Ribolux tweed amp. Harrison played his Futurama guitar through a Selma True Voice amp and Sutcliffe played on his Hofner 500 5 bass through the Gibson Les Paul amp. As there was no need for a fourth guitarist in the group, Paul McCartney decided to switch to playing piano with Pete Best on drums. After the second trip, Sutcliffe decided to leave the group and it was in this transition that the members also changed their amplification. Harrison managed to acquire Sutcliffe's Gibson GA40 Les Paul amplifier and he used it with his Futurama guitar and McCartney had now switched to bass and needed something more powerful than his El Pico amplifier and therefore used Harrison's Selmore True Voice amp. Lennon continued to play his Rickenbacker through his Fender Ribolux amp. In late 1961, Paul McCartney commissioned Liverpool guitarist Adrian Barber to make him what was called a coffin bass cabinet. This consisted of a single 15 inch speaker in a reflex ported cabinet with two chrome handles and wheels on the side. He used his Selma True Voice amplifier to power the new cabinet by disconnecting the speaker on the Selma and hooking up the coffin speaker to the power amp of the True Voice. This Selma amp and coffin speaker combination produced a much more powerful bass tone. This was a pretty large cabinet and they had lots of fun carrying this in and out of the uh, cavern club. Pete Best remembers moving the coffin around. Every couple of shows, there'd be a flight of stairs which you had to carry this thing up. And it was then we'd wonder why he couldn't have gotten something smaller. We'd have sweat streaming off us. But the beauty of it was, with all the laughing and joking aside, it did produce a great sound. The first time Paul plugged it in and used it, we just said, my God, this is incredible. It added to the Beatles sound. On December the 6th, Brian Epstein made a proposal that for a fee of 25% of the band's total gross earnings, he would become the manager of the Beatles. Mike Smith, who was the A&R representative for Decca Records, decided that the Beatles amplifiers were not good enough for their first recordings. After countless shows and many long hours of use, for those early Decca sessions, the Beatles used the studio's own amplifiers. Unfortunately, it's not known what type they were. However, it was these same Decca demo recordings that obtained the interest of George Martin, head of Parlophone Records. 
On June the 6th, the Beatles went into Abbey Road Recording Studios to record four tracks which included the song Love Me Do. George Martin was not happy with Paul McCartney's bass sound. He requested engineer Ken Townsend do something about this. So therefore he fixed up a leak TL12 amplifier and a big tannoy speaker soldering the jack socket onto its input stage. This produced a distortion free bass sound and this was the system that was used on the session. It's worth mentioning that most of the Beatles amps up to this time were bought on higher purchase. So Brian Epstein decided to pay off the group's outstanding loans and in particular settle the account with Hesse's for the True Voice amp. Around June 1962, both Lennon's Vibrolux and Harrison's GA40 amplifiers were recovered in black plastic sheeting. In July 1962, Harrison, Lennon and Epstein went to Hesse's music store in Liverpool to purchase two new Vox amplifiers. Harrison obtained a 30 watt AC30 model and Lennon purchased a 15 watt AC15 model. Lennon's Vox amplifier was a fawn covered amp with a brown grill cloth and leather handles. This particular amp was fitted with a pair of 12 inch Goodman's Alnico speakers. It came with one EZ81 rectifier tube, one EF86, one 12AU7, three 12AX7 preamp tubes and a pair of EL84 power tubes. Harrison's Vox AC30 twin had the same size cabinet as Lennon's. It was also fawn covered with a brown grill cloth. Although this amp was fitted with a pair of higher spec 12 inch Celestian T530 speakers, otherwise known as the Celestian Blues. The valve lineup was a GZ34 rectifier tube, one 12AU7 and four 12AX7 preamp valves. A set of four EL84 power tubes producing a total of 30 watts. The debut for these amplifiers was at the Tower Ballroom in New Brighton on July the 27th. Harrison's black covered Gibson GA40 amplifier was on stage as a backup. In early 1963, Brian Epstein would visit Jennings Music Shop in Charing Cross Road in London. There he met shop manager Reg Clark. Reg recalls, Brian said to me he had a band that had been playing in Germany. They were now back in England and he said they were going to grow very big. He said he'd like to do a deal with us to get some of our AC30 amplifiers. He told me his boys were going to be so big and do so much promotion for us that it would pay off a thousand times over. So I had to phone Tom Jennings, the owner of Vox, telling him of this conversation. I remember Tom's exact words very well. He said, what does he think we are? An effing philanthropic society? But I took it upon myself to do that deal with Epstein because Tom really didn't say no. Epstein stated to Clark that if the deal was done, Vox could use the Beatles for any kind of promotion at all and it wouldn't cost the company any money. He also stated that the Beatles would never use anything else but Vox amplifiers while Epstein was the manager. Reg Clark recalls, every time I got photographs from Epstein, it never cost a thing. He kept his word. One of the reasons why Epstein chose Vox was that the successful British groups around that time, such as The Shadows, were also using Vox amplifiers. It's worth noting that the two original Vox amps owned by Harrison and Lennon, bought on higher purchase at Hesse's in Liverpool, were fully paid off by JMI. Dick Denny, the chief designer at Vox, states that the first AC30s owned by the Beatles were retrofitted with top boost circuits. It gave a 30 decibel rise at 10 kilocycles. At this time, Vox did not have a dedicated bass amplifier. Epstein acquired a quad amplifier from Adrian Barber, who had previously made McCartney's coffin speaker cabinet. The quad two valve amplifier was rated at 15 watts, although Barber states that it was closer to 40 or 50 watts after he had modded the preamp to provide more bass frequencies. This was a mono amplifier and worked perfectly with the coffin speaker cabinet. Barber mounted the quad in a army surplus ammunition box with a metal top and handles at the side. McCartney used a quad bass amplifier through the coffin speaker cabinet for the next eight months. On 22nd of August 1962, the Beatles were filmed at the cavern by Granada TV. Photos show Lennon playing his Bigsby equipped blonde Rickenbacker through a Vox AC15. Harrison was using his Gretsch Durojet through his AC30. Also notice the top boost circuit fitted to the back panel. McCartney was playing his Hofner bass through his quad amp and coffin speaker. By this time Ringo Starr had replaced Pete Best on the drums. 
On September the 4th, with this new lineup, they recorded a second version of Love Me Do at Abbey Road Studios. Photos reveal that McCartney was playing his Hofner bass through Adrian Barber's designed quad bass amp, and Harrison and Lennon were using their Fox amplifiers. It's interesting to point out that possibly on this recording, Lennon and Harrison's Gibson's J160Es were plugged straight into the AC30s. Even with these acoustics plugged in, it was a very clean and full tone. Epstein was very keen for the Beatles' equipment to look the part. He sent Harrison's and Lennon's Vox Amps and McCartney's Coffin Bass Cab to Barrett's Music Shop in Manchester for an overhaul. McCartney's bass cabinet was recovered with a black vinyl. Epstein later visited Jennings' shop in London and made a deal to swap the two fawn-coloured Vox amps for a pair of new black AC30 twin amps. These amps were stock treble model AC30s without the top boost circuit. These amps had black covering, brown grill cloth, leather handles and brass air vents. They were both fitted with a pair of 12-inch Blue Celestian T530 speakers. They ran on GZ34 rectifier valves, one 12AU7, four 12AX7 preamp tubes, and a set of four EL84 power valves. Both were 30 watts. Soon after the Beatles had received these new Black Fox AC30s, they were stolen. Reg Clark recalls taking another pair of AC30s to the Cavern Club due to the first pair being stolen. From 1963, Mal Evans joined the Beatles as their roadie, looking after all their equipment on the road. The Beatles recorded their 14-track album, Please Please Me, at Abbey Road Studios on February the 11th, 1963. The session was recorded onto a two-track tape machine, almost entirely live with very few overdubs. For this session, they used the Vox AC30 twin amps without top boost, and McCartney's Hofner bass was played through the studio's Leak power amp and a Tannoy 15-inch speaker cabinet. In 1963, Vox released their first designated bass amplifier. It was developed by engineers Alan Harding and Doug McDonald. Its model name was T60. This was a solid-state amplifier. The head featured single-volume bass and treble controls. Vox sent their T60 bass amp to McCartney at the end of March 1963. It was loaded with a pair of blue Tannoy 15-inch speakers. McCartney didn't use this amplifier for very long due to reliability issues with the Germanian transistors. In mid-1963, they recorded their single She Loves You with the B-side I'll Get You. For this session, Lennon recorded using his Gibson J160E plugged into his Vox AC30 amplifier. McCartney used his Vox T60 amp head and speaker cabinet and Harrison used a Gretsch Country Gentleman plugged into his Vox AC30. In July 1963, Vox took back Lennon and Harrison's AC30s and replaced them with a new pair. The new pair had top boost circuits retrofitted onto the back of the amplifiers. The only difference with the new pair were the newer style carrying handles. Again, these were fitted with 12 inch T530 Celestian Blue speakers. McCartney's T60 Vox bass amp was also upgraded. Mal Evans was constantly having to fix and repair this amp. Because transistor technology was relatively new, McCartney's new amp with a valve bass AC30 head. This had a slightly different circuit which was tweaked for bass. Vox supplied a stock AC30 chrome stand to hold the bass head. These three new amplifiers would provide the group's amplification until the end of 1963. At the end of 1963, Brian Epstein planned his first Beatles Christmas show at Finsbury Park, Astoria, North London. The noise from the fans was so loud that the AC30s were struggling to compete. Dick Denny, who was the head engineer at Vox, came up with the AC50 amplifier, especially for the Beatles to overcome this problem. To quote Dick Denny, That's why I came up with the AC50 guitar amplifier. I made up the first ones using an AC30 cabinet with two 12 inch speakers plus a horn speaker for more top end. The horn didn't fit, so I cut a hole for it in the back of the cabinet. I didn't have the time to make up a new cabinet because we had to get them their new amps. There was always a rush. The new amplifier was in piggyback style, in other words, with a separate amplifier and cabinet. I used two EL34 valves to get the power, but I still think the AC30 with the EL84 valves 
was a better design. It sounded more musical to me. These new amplifiers were delivered to the Beatles at the beginning of their Christmas shows at Finsbury Park. Both Lennon and Harrison received a single channel Vox AC50 Super Twin amplifier head. These were also known as small box AC50 Mark I heads. They came with two inputs. Valves were GZ34 rectifier tube, 112AU7, 212AX7 preamp tubes and two EL34 power tubes, meaning that these delivered 50 watts of power. The cabinets featured two 12-inch Blue Celestian T530 speakers and a single Goodman's mid-dax horn for additional high frequencies. It's worth noting from this time onwards, were always offered any prototype amplifiers that Vox were developing and quite often new amps would be developed specifically with the Beatles in mind. McCartney also received a new single channel AC80-100 bass head. This featured two inputs, volume bass and treble knobs. This came with a solid state rectifier, one ECC83 and two ACC82 preamp valves. It also featured four EL34 tubes delivering a total of 100 watts power. He also received a matching AC100 speaker cabinet. This had a pair of Blue Celestian 15 inch speakers. This would in fact remain McCartney's main amplification setup for the next two years. Here in this photo we can see McCartney with his AC100 head on top of his T60 bass cabinet. Harrison and Lennon are playing through their AC50 heads which are actually underneath their 2x12 cabinets. As you can see, the speaker cabinets were sitting on top of Chrome Vox stands. The Beatles' most important live performance ever was probably on February the 9th, 1964, on the Ed Sullivan Show. Unfortunately, we cannot see any of their Vox amplification from this recorded performance. The Vox amplifiers were concealed to the sides of the stage. This did not affect Vox's popularity due to the Beatles using their amplifiers. In this photo of the Beatles recording at the BBC, on July 28th, 1964, both Harrison and Lennon could be seen using a pair of new Vox AC100 amplifier heads. Dick Denny actually hand soldered these amplifiers himself. One each were given for Lennon and Harrison and also another one for spare. These heads came with one ECC83 valve, two ECC82 preamp valves, EL84 power amp valves. These delivered a total of 100 watts. These were single channel amplifiers. These amplifier heads came with the AC50 Mark II cabinets. At this time, McCartney was still using his Vox AC100 bass amplifier and cabinet. In August 1964, Vox delivered to the Beatles two new cabinets for the AC100 heads. As you can see, these were pretty large cabinets and they featured four 12 inch Grey Celestian T1088 Mark I 15 watt speakers and two Goodman's mid-axe high frequency horns. It also featured a crossover network which improved their efficiency. These cabinets came with a Vox stand which was able to swivel. McCartney was given a spare AC100 bass head to be used as a backup during their upcoming US tour. Also in 1964, the Beatles recorded their LP Beatles for Sale. As you can see from the photos, they used their AC100 guitar amps and bass amp. It's worth pointing out that in 1964, the Thomas Organ Company of California approached Vox offering a proposal to acquire Vox distribution in America. So Vox would export Vox guitars and amps to Thomas Organ and in return the Thomas Organ Company would ship Vox their organs. On the 1964 American tour, the Beatles used their Vox application which consisted of McCartney using his two Hofner basses through a Vox AC100 bass rig, Harrison using his Gretsch Country Gentleman and his Rickenbacker 36012 through a Vox AC100 guitar rig, and Lennon using his Rickenbacker 325 and his Rickenbacker 32512 through his Vox AC100. A complete set of AC100 guitar and bass amps were also brought along as spares. Just before the Beatles' second tour, and third visit to the USA in 1965, they took delivery of new Vox AC100 amplifiers. They were pretty much the same as their previous AC100, with the main differences being the construction of the head cabinet. The Beatles used their AC100 guitar amps and AC100 bass amp for the concert at Shea Stadium. For the 1965 recording of Rubber Soul, 
The Beatles mainly used their Vox AC100 amps for amplification, although included in this recording setup were a pair of Vox AC30s. Also used in this studio session was a Fender Bassman. This was used to record McCartney's bass. This piggyback style amp featured cream coloured toy licks. The amp head came with four 7025 preamp valves and a pair of five 881 power valves rated at 50 watts of power. The cabinet featured two 12 inch speakers. In November 1965, Vox delivered three new amplifiers to the Beatles, two Vox AC100 guitar amps and a Vox AC100 bass amplifier. This is a pretty uh, interesting photo from 1965. Uh, this was um, at Don Mayer Warehouse in central London, where rehearsing for their UK tour. Here you can see them playing through two Vox AC30s and a cream coloured Fender Bassman amp. In this photo from April 1966, Paul McCartney can be seen playing his Rickenbacker 4001S through a cream coloured Fender Bassman amplifier. Fender also delivered two new Jules Showman amplifiers at Abbey Road Studios. These heads were rated at 85 watts of power and came with four 6L6GC power valves. These were two channel amps with a normal channel, a bright switch plus a volume treble and bass controls. They also featured a vibrato channel and a bright switch plus volume treble middle and bass controls along with speed and intensity controls for the vibrato circuit. The Jewel Showman speaker cabinet featured a pair of 15 inch JBL D140F speakers. Also present at Abbey Road Studios were prototype Vox amplifiers. These were 120 watt hybrid amps. These amplifiers featured a solid state preamp along with four KT88 valves, one EL84 and two ECL86 valves. These would be known as the Vox 7120 amps. The 7120 came with a 4x12 speaker cabinet. The bass amplifier equivalent was the 4120, although Paul McCartney never used this amplifier. Here we can see John Lennon playing his Gretsch 6120 at Abbey Road Studios. The Vox 7120 amplifier is functioning as a great wine glass holder here. In this photo from 1966, we can see the Beatles performing in Germany. John, Paul and George were all playing through Vox 7120 amplifiers here. For the 14 City American Tour, which was planned in 1966, the Thomas Organ Company actually developed their own American made Vox amplifiers. These were called the Vox Super Beetle amp. The Super Beetle was essentially a solid state amplifier, and it was actually one of the most expensive amplifiers available in the US in 1966. The V1141, as it was known, retailed for $1,225. There were two different variants of this amplifier, the V1142 and also the V1141, which featured a fuzz distortion effect. The preamp section included tremolo reverb, a top boost switch and an MRB mid-range boost circuit. The speaker cabinets included four Celestian G12 Alnico speakers and two Goodman's mid-axe horns. When the Beatles took hold of these amps and saw the name the Super Beetle, they complained to Brian Epstein that nothing was better than the Beatles. Accordingly, Vox changed the name to Vox Beetle. Here you can see the Beatles backstage rehearsing for the US tour. And here you can see some Vox practice amps. By 1966, Vox had discontinued the 6120 amplifier design. In November of 1966, they received new amplifiers from Vox. These were known as the 730 model. The Vox 730 had a solid state preamp section and rectifier. However, it used an ECC83 phase inverter valve and also four EL84 valves in the power section. This amp was rated at 30 watts. The base version of this amplifier was called 430 and was also rated at 30 watts. As well as the two 730 and one 430 amplifiers, two Vox were also delivered to Abbey Road around the time that the Beatles recorded Sgt Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. The Vox Conqueror was 100% solid state and featured effects like fuzz, tone X, treble boost, MRB, which was the mid-range boost, tremolo and reverb. It was rated at 30 watts with a peak of 70 watts and came with a pair of 12 inch Celestian T1088 Unico speakers. So along with the Fender Bassman as well as the Fender Showmans, 
These were the main amplifiers that were used on Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band album. McCartney used the 730 on the song with a little help from my friends. He also used the 430 bass amp on the song Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. On March 28th, 1967, we can see here in this photo, Paul is in Abbey Road Studio 2. We can see that he's playing a Fender Esquire through a Selma Thunderbird amp. He used this to, he used this setup to record the solos for Good Morning, Good Morning and Being for the Benefits of Mr. Kite. This was a single channel 50 watt combo. It featured two 12 inch speakers. The control layout had a five preset push button for tone controls, a tremolo circuit with speed and depth controls, a Hammond reverb and variable depth control. It came with a GZ34 rectifier valve, one 6BR8, an EM84 and four ECC83 preamp valves, and also came with two EL34 power valves. This amp was also fitted with a chrome stand which allowed the unit to be swiveled back for better sound distribution. On June the 25th, 1967, the first global satellite television program, Our World, broadcast featuring 19 acts representing 19 nations, including the Beatles singing All You Needed Is Love. For this performance, McCartney played his Rickenbacker 401S based through a Fox Conqueror amp and a Conqueror speaker cabinet. Harrison used his famous psychedelic painted Stratocaster through a cream Fender Bassman amp. Lennon decided to concentrate on singing as he was too nervous to play his guitar. Had he had played his guitar, he would have played it through a Fox 730 amp with matching cabinet, which was set up for him just in case he changed his mind. Guys, check out this photo from the Beatles Sgt. Pepper era. Whilst filming a promo for the Hello Goodbye single, you can see them here with a Fox 40 amp and two Vox Conqueror amps with 2x12 cabinets. In February 1968, whilst recording the song Across the Universe, the Beatles used a Fender Blackface Dual Showman amp, a Vox Conqueror guitar amp, and also a Vox Foundation bass amp, which was a 50 watt solid state bass head. This amp came with two inputs, volume, bass, treble knobs, and a mid boost switch. The speaker cabinet came loaded with a single 18 inch Celestian, T1296 speaker. In August 1967, the Beatles manager, Brian Epstein, died, and therefore they were no longer committed to their gentleman's agreement to use only Vox amplifiers exclusively. For the White Album sessions, the amplifiers used were most probably the cream colour Fender Bassman, a number of Vox prototype amps, including the Conqueror head with its 2x12 cabinet, and also the Blackface Fender Showman head and cabinet. Later in 1968, the band received a Blackface Deluxe Amp and also a Silverface Deluxe Reverb. Essentially, these amps had the same circuit, although there was a few minor changes. They both contained 6V6 power valves and a GZ34 rectifier valve. They were rated at 20 watts. Each was equipped with vibrato and had a 12-inch speaker. Guys, this is the photo from Twickenham Film Studios. On September the 4th, 1968, whilst recording a film clip for the uh, song Revolution. Around that time in the UK, the Musicians' Union insisted that everybody has to play live. The way the Beatles overcame this was by switching the pilot lights of the Black Face Deluxe and the Silver Face Deluxe to the on position. Although you can see here, Paul McCartney is just playing through a Fender Showman cabinet with no amp on top. On January the 2nd, 1969, the Beatles went to Twickenham Film Studios for the Let It Be film. For these sessions, new Fender amps were used. These were two twin reverb amps, one for Lennon and one for Harrison, and McCartney used a new Fender basement amp. These were all manufactured in 1968 and came with the silver face control panel, as well as the aluminium trim around the grill cloth. The twin reverbs came with four 6L6GC power valves producing 85 watts. Each combo came with two 12 inch speakers and featured a vibrato and reverb circuit. The Fender Bassman was a two channel amp and came with two 6L6 GC power valves producing 50 watts and came with a basement speaker cabinet fitted with two 15 inch speakers. After the Let It Be sessions, George Harrison decided to walk out of the Beatles and was only convinced by the Beatles to come back when they abandoned the idea that they should be a live band and instead focus on another studio album. The Get Back recordings were recorded in Apple's newly built recording studio at 3 Savile Road in central London. For these recordings, George Harrison had received a gift from Eric Clapton, 
It was a Leslie rotating speaker cabinet, model number 147RV. This also featured a reverb control on the unit. In order that he could connect his guitar to the Leslie cabinet, Harrison plugged into a Leslie combo preamp, which was designed for line level instruments. And you can hear this sound on the Get Back recordings. The last public performance that the Beatles gave was on the top of their Apple headquarters in central London on January the 30th, 1969. Paul McCartney played his 63 Hofner bass through a silver face Fender Bassman amp and cabinet. Lennon played his Epiphone Casino through a silver face Fender Twin reverb. Harrison played his Fender Rosewood Telecaster through a silver face twin. Abbey Road was the Beatles' last studio album, and sessions at Abbey Road were booked from July the 1st until August 29th. The amps used on these sessions were identical for those as the Get Back sessions, which were basically silver face Fender Twin reverb amps and the silver face baseman for McCartney. Thanks guys for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. This is Ramon Goose signing out. Hasta la vista.